Good evening and welcome once again to the Marty Heiser Show. We have got an incredible show. As we speak right now, there is a man with man's best friend waiting in the wings to come on. That's Jan Rifkin, who's running for selectman uh, for the town of Ridgefield. He's coming in. Those of you that live in Ridgefield have seen his lawn signs. It's a man with a dog, sort of a fusion candidate. They're coming in here, both the man and the dog, and we're going to hear from both of them about what they see as the future of the town of Ridgefield. Before we get to our illustrious guest, well, we are going to look at the candidacy of Ron Paul. Yes, Ron Paul, rising in the polls, an incredibly intelligent guy. You may have seen him on Fox News and other places. We're going to look at the candidacy of Ron Paul in just a minute with my wonderful guest. But before we do, this show is often critical of our president, President Barack Obama. But I, now they might not, my opinion may not be shared with those who support Ron Paul, but I have to give him a thumbs up on what's happened in Libya and the fact that Muammar, the mad dog in the Middle East, Gaddafi, has gone on to his reward. Some think there may be 70 virgins. I'm not so sure. But I know for sure that that terrorist-loving leader of Libya is no longer roaming the planet. Now, some of you that are young may not remember uh, the attack in Lockerbie, Scotland, or that's where the plane uh, uh, came to rest. But that was one of the attacks. And also when Ronald Reagan was in office, there was a discotheque in Berlin that Libyan agents uh, planted bombs and some American servicemen were uh, blown up there. So that's what's happened. And Muammar Gaddafi can be added to the list of those terrorists that have been taken out uh, by none other than uh, the presidency of Barack Obama. So we're critical of our president, but on this case, at least speaking for myself, not necessarily my guests, I give you a thumbs up and an attaboy on uh, having that drone take out uh, the convoy that had uh, um, Muammar Gaddafi in it. And then some of you seen the videotape, uh, his citizens did the rest. That said, I just needed to get that off my chest. I am delighted to invite Bill Costello. Thank you so much for joining us. And your, and your lovely daughter, Barb, is here as well. And uh, thank you very much. And then Keith uh, Villa, you're here as well. And um, we're here to talk about Ron Paul. And Bill, let me just start with you. Sure. The candidacy of Ron Paul, why should all Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, liberals, take a good long look at this man? And why do you think he's going to be the nominee for the Republican Party? Yeah, well, Marty, the, the reason that uh, Ron Paul is going to be the nominee is that common sense matters. And when you look at the deficit and you look at the mess we're in today, mm -hmm. the only candidate really that has a plan to get us out of the mess is Ron Paul. Everyone else talks about plans that are nine years, 10 years, 20 years away. Ron Paul talks about restoring our economy in less than three years. Mm -hmm. And, and it, really the discussion is about what the government does for us. Mm -hmm. And right now we expect the government to do everything for us yeah. and that's why we're in this mess. And Ron Paul says, no, why would you have three education departments? Yeah. One at the federal level, one at the state level, and one at the local level. Mm -hmm. Ron Paul said, no, that's not, the, that's not what the Constitution says. And it doesn't make common sense. We're spending all this money. Where should education be run? It should be run at the local level. Yeah, yeah. That's where it can be run the most effectively. What do you, just off the top of your head, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but what is the Federal Department of Education's budget? Do you know what that is? I do not. It's, it's, it's certainly It's in the billions, billions and billions of dollars. It's, it's too much. Yeah. Exactly. It's, it's, it's certainly people. billions. And, uh, but you know, the, the good news here uh -huh. is that we have the opportunity today to turn this around. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you think about the Europe and some of the other places where they're in debt, uh -huh. where they really believe that they can turn around their problem. Right. But we do believe we can turn around and turn it around quickly. Mm -hmm. Think about that 44 cents on every dollar in taxes goes to pay for the debt. Yeah. What can we do with that 44 cents? Even people on the left think of, uh, you know, we, want, we should restore bridges, we should do other things. Those infrastructure, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. What could you do with 44 cents of every dollar? Yeah. So the first thing we need to do is get out of debt. 
Okay. Let me just, uh, um, if we could, uh, the, the, when you talk about we, locally there's an organization called the Ridgefield Liberty Co-op. Right, and one thing that we really want to uh, talk about, I don't know if we can get a close-up of this, is you're going to be having a town hall meeting, or it's going to be a Ridgefield Town Hall, on November 3rd at 7 p.m. If we can get a shot of that, we'll just keep that on there, so if people want to go, that's going to be November 3rd at Town Hall, lower conference room. Correct. Okay, and, uh, and Barb, tell me a little bit, what is this Ridgefield Liberty Co-op? Well, it's the Ridgefield Liberty Cooperative, mm -hmm. and actually, um, Bill and I discovered Ron Paul during the last election cycle, 2008, and, um, and once we discovered him, um, we, we went on YouTube and we learned about him and heard his past speeches. We're like, you know what, there's something unique, there's something really different about this guy. We, when you hear the truth, you're drawn to it. And so for the first time, I really got excited and I Googled like local Ron Paul groups. Give me the dates again. When, how long have you been on the, the Ron Paul? Oh, uh, four years ago. So four years four ago. Years okay, ago okay. This so month. It, was, it was the last primary. Last sure. primary. Okay. Huh? And yeah. uh, well, long story short, we, we Googled, I Googled Ron Paul and I'm like, oh, guess what? He's, there's these things called meetup groups. Oh. And I noticed there's meetup groups all of, around the country for Ron Paul. There were like thousands of them. Okay. Like just to give you an idea, Hillary Clinton had like 20. Right. Uh, Barack Obama had like 115. Ron Paul had like 1,200 of these, and, and lo and behold, there was one in Danbury. And I said to Bill, why don't we go to one of these meetings and see what this is all about? So we went just, to a- Just a human interest. Does she come up with these ideas often? <laughs> like, is there ever a Tupperware party or, you know, like that Lamaze method, childbirth? Are you being taken to these things often? I, uh, or were years you a ago. willing uh, co-conspirator in this case? I, I wasn't willing at the start, okay. but I've become willing. So. All right, yeah, all now right. Now he's a convert. They, oftentimes, uh, you know, this is how this works. Okay. But anyhow, so we went to the Sheraton Hotel, uh -huh. and uh, that's where we met Richard Land, who was really spearheaded a lot of this, okay. uh, along with Keith, and uh, and Bill and I sat in, and lo we kept on going to meetings, and we kept on having these get-togethers at the Sheraton, uh -huh. and uh, and there were a lot of different people from, like, maybe we wouldn't normally socialize with some, I mean, you know, they're younger, uh, uh, some older, different right. backgrounds, but as Ron Paul likes to say, liberty brings people together. And, uh, and that's what, it, we all had one thing in common, we wanted constitutional government. Okay. Now, Keith, uh, while you, you're going to queue up some of these videos, <laughs> yes. okay, and we're going to get that ready. What brought you to, to uh, the Ron Paul way of thinking? And then I want to see some of these video clips that you have. Too. Well, I so think I've always instinctively been libertarian in my uh -huh. thinking, which I think Ron Paul is as well. Okay. And, you know, he appealed to me as a candidate because a, a lot of candidates kind of talk the talk, but they don't always walk the walk. Right. And, and Ron Paul's, you know, one of the only ones I've seen out there who's got a consistent record in Congress of, you know, never voting for, for unbalanced budgets and voting for limited government and individual liberty consistently across the board. You look at a lot of the candidates, they talk about individual liberty, but when you look at the records, Romney's a great example with his health care. Mm -hmm. He's explained time and again, well, he thought it was right for Massachusetts, but not for the country. Right. But nobody's really gone and asked him in any of the debates that I've seen, well, why do you think even the state of Massachusetts, the government should tell people what health care they need and force them to buy it, rather than letting them make their own decisions for themselves. Okay. So Ron Paul, you know, he's been consistent throughout his career. He's a true believer in individual liberty, something I've always believed in. I, I think at the end of the day, free people should be free to do whatever they like, so long as it doesn't interfere with the liberty of another person. Okay. Cue up to some of these videos. Okay. Let's see what they got so in there. No, we're I'm gonna go to our, our crack technical team <laughs> and just point it at that camera and, uh, and we're gonna do that. You know, while, while she's queuing sure. that up, let me just ask you, Bill, there's kind of a, a bit of an undercurrent, I think, um, of Ron Paul activists. There's, there's a bit of a chip on the shoulder, if you don't mind me, you know, saying that. Um, and my question is, if Ron Paul isn't the nominee, are you guys going to, 
you know, unite around the Republican nominee? Or are you going to take your ball and yes. go home or yes. pull a Ross Perot? Or how's that going to work? You know, out I think Ron. Are you ready with that? I'm I ready. think Ron Paul ready. does two things. Um, He's going to be president, so that's one. Okay. But he also forces the other candidates to ante up in their stands on the issues. Right. And so it depends how far he's been able to push the Republican Party right. to ante up on the deficit, as an example, right. getting out of foreign wars. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if Ron Paul has his way, he'll be the nominee. Right. If he's not the nominee, if the nominee all of a sudden mimics Ron Paul on all the issues, right. I think we'd support that person. Sometimes that's how this works. You know, I mean, if you force the issue, if you have your set of issues that you feel passionate about, and he, they come around to their way of thinking, even if he isn't the standard bearer, in a, in a way you've won. Right. Let's go to the videotape. Okay. If that's ready, push one. play, and uh, let's go to it. mentioned consistency, so. Excellent. Just point at that camera, and uh, let's yeah, see what we got. We have to leave it now. Sticking around. New foreclosures jumped 20%. Seven million jobs lost. The nation's debt keeps surging. Change has come to America. The concept of TARP, I was willing to go along with it. I think there is need for economic stimulus. I signed a letter with the uh, Democrat. Hey. Where are the people that say all of this stuff is socialism? There is to be. The role of government ought to be for the protection of liberty, not for the intrusion in economic affairs. We've spent too much, we tax too much, we borrow too much. It's bankrupting this country. I've been talking about these problems for a long, long time. Now we're bankrupt, and we have to decide which way we're going to go. I'm Ron Paul, and I approve this message. Okay, now we're going to, uh, as we go, we're going to have a couple more of those videos uh, as we cue them up. I think they're, they're pretty compelling. And that video went back to 1988, 88. I think it was. Yep. And they're saying the same thing. And, oh. and that's why we've been talking about Ron Paul's consistency. Right. He hasn't changed his stance on any of these issues. Right. He's, he, you know, he has been against uh, uh, a lot of the spending that has gone on. He hasn't voted for it. In fact, he said if he were president, he would take a salary of $39,000, okay. which is the average salary in the United States today. Okay. And, uh, and really, he's, he is not, he's probably... His uh, uh, one thing that it's tough for him, he's not a great politician. Okay. Meaning a great politician is somebody who can look you in the eye and tell you something and really go back and change what they believe. He can't do that. In that and case, Mitt Romney would be a darn good politician. He's a very good politician. Okay. But, but that's, so that's one of the things. You've mm -hmm. got to take a little time with Ron yeah. to get to know his stances look back on what he said in the past and say, this guy isn't changing. He's, he believes this, right. you know? Keith, let me ask you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the contrarian approach here just because, you know, it's a, it, it can't be a complete love fest here on Ron Paul. Let me go uh, foreign relations with you. On, as we all know, obviously, on 9-11, we were attacked. Um, it wasn't by a nation state, but it was by a, a terrorist organization headquartered in Afghanistan. The country made a decision, the Congress voted on it, to declare war not only on Afghanistan, but a year or two later also on Iraq, and we went to war. My understanding of Ron Paul is that he is against, sort of, and you can tell me after I'm done, against all of these foreign entanglements, and we should, we should come back. Where, where is the, what I would call the, because I, I approved of, of, of those wars in the stance of the current, or the George Bush at the time. What would a President Ron Paul, what would his approach have been if heaven forbid were attacked again, or, or is he going to be strong enough to protect the American people? Well, no. I can't speak for Ron Paul himself. But well, sure let, you let, can. Let That's just, what you're on the let show let, for. Let, let me just say this. He did vote for the war in Afghanistan. Okay. And the reason I believe he did is because we were attacked and it was a legitimate response in defense of our nation. What he certainly did not approve of Iraq because... Did he vote against it as a member yes, of Congress? Yes, yes. He voted against the resolution to authorize force. And, you know, the reason is that Iraq never really posed a threat to us. We know now they didn't have the weapons that were part of the reason for this. 
I don't believe, and neither does Ron Paul, that we should be enforcing UN resolutions. As, uh, you know, Ameri that's not America's job. It's not the American taxpayer's job to pay for. Mm -hmm. I think in the in the instance of Afghanistan, it was a legitimate war. Again, Ron Paul voted for it. Right. But it's ten years later, and the goal right now, as far as I can tell, is to put in and install a corrupt and ineffective government of Hamid Karzai. Right. So how that helps the United States or is in our best interest, I don't understand. I think the main point on foreign policy, we certainly should act in our own defense when our interests are threatened, mm -hmm. but we shouldn't go around policing the world. We shouldn't go around fighting other people's wars, for instance, in Libya. Mm -hmm. And we shouldn't be the world's policemen. Mm -hmm. uh, the, these interventions, generally speaking, cause more problems than they solve. You look at Iraq, you know, you have the Kurdish problem in the north. They started having skirmishes with Turkey, and now we're in between our, our closest ally in Iraq as we try to fight that war, and our NATO ally in Turkey. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we put ourselves into these middle of, the, of these things, and they just grow and grow, and you have mission creep. And so right now, Ron we're there Paul is president. Right now, knowing mm -hmm. what we know about Afghanistan, you say initially we're there. He would pull the troops out right away, He'd pull the troops out of Iraq. He would not try to contain Iran, and, and he would certainly not have been in favor of what we did in uh, Libya. Is that pretty much it? I believe so. I'm not even I, bringing up Uganda, which I, I, have to, I couldn't find <coughs> on the map. But. I believe so, and I hope so. I don't, I don't think U.S. interests are being served in any of the places you just mentioned. Uh -huh. Iran is not a threat to the United States of America. I mean, Iran doesn't even have an air force or a navy. They're, they're basically a third world nation with no real military. So, so why the U.S. should worry about Iran is beyond me. Well, here's why. Here's okay. why. Because it was interesting. Because in preparation for this, uh, among other things, well, I guess I watch Fox News all the time anyways, but in preparation for this show, Ron Paul was on for a long time uh, on uh, the, you know, uh, their news program. He was in the center seat. And, and he said that, you know, if, even if Iran gets a nuclear weapon, what's the big deal? Russia has nuclear weapons. China has nuclear weapons. And my approach, we talked about this before, is that in those cases, they, they sort of bought into this concept of a mutual assured destruction. In other words, you have two people pointing a gun at each other, like us in the Soviet Union during the, the Cold War. And, you know, in, because of self-preservation, both weren't going to fire. If Iran gets a nuclear weapon, is there anyone that thinks that they won't use it against Israel and, and their other neighbors? And that's what I think many people are concerned about in that case, and they might be a little concerned about Ron Paul because he's kind of like, hey, leave him alone, let's bring our boys home and let these threats develop. Do well, you have thought? Ac actually, um, Israel, and most people don't know this, but Israel has 300 nuclear weapons right now. Right. They are armed to the teeth. Right. And, um, and originally, when we went into Iraq uh, or Afghanistan, it was uh, to uh -huh. capture bin Laden, right? right? Mm -hmm. So now he's gone. Right. So the whole pretense Another for the war. Another uh, <laughs> thumbs up to our current president. Okay, so Gotta the whole, give him the props. The whole pretense and the Navy SEALs. for yeah. the war was to go after bin Laden. Now it's and if you look, okay, so the so the reason for war now is over, basically, right? Because that's why we went in. And now, uh, if you look at the reason why they, um, the Muslim world seems to hate the United States, mm -hmm. and you can look at um, CIA, uh, you know, uh, communications, yes. and Michael Schur, who uh, used to be the head of the Bin Laden desk yes. for the CIA, uh -huh. Uh -huh. said the reason why they hated us, what, what instituted this, this hatred towards the U.S., because right. it's not because we're free and prosperous, because Switzerland is free and prosperous, and right. they don't attack Switzerland. It's because we had bases in the Holy Land in Mecca. Right. And that's what precipitated these attacks. So it's because we're over there. Uh -huh. And, uh, and uh, that's why Ron Paul is like, okay, mission accomplished. We need to extract ourselves from the Middle East. We're not making more friends when the drones uh, attack uh, the wrong house and wipe out uh, women, children, families uh -huh. uh, that maybe were pro-U.S. and now you're killing are, I mean, these people have children. They are, they're not, I think, what, uh, especially Fox News, they like to portray them as kind of aliens, and we have to protect ourselves from these alien people. Muslims are, there are, their families, they're, and we constantly killing, I know the leaders might be in question, but, yeah. but even with Israel, when they were after Eichmann, mm -hmm. who was a heinous uh, Nazi murderer, right. when they captured him, they didn't murder him. Yeah. They tried him at the world court, and then they executed him. Yeah. 
We have been going around the world murdering people. This is not U.S. policy. Yeah. This isn't even Christian. The only, the only thing I would say is prior to 9-11, uh, there were troops stationed in Saudi Arabia outside of Mecca and That's Medina, right. but at the invitation of the Saudi royal family, because you'll recall this guy, the guy Saddam Hussein uh, attacked Kuwait and was, and was massing troops on the border of Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia is an ally of us, and that's why those troops were there. The thing I would take uh, issue with you, you gave the example of Switzerland, but I would take the example of Bali, a nice, you know, island nation and one of the terrorists attacked there. Who did Bali ever attack? I would say the motivation behind these uh, Muslim terrorists has nothing to do with if you're stationing troops around. It's that they have this warped view of their God is telling them to attack these other countries. But that's not what the and we CIA, need to that's not what the document said, though. Do you know, I mean, uh -huh. that's not what Michael Scherer said. He sided with Ron Paul. That, that that instigated this. Okay, so what you're proposing is that if the United States would just withdraw from the world and specifically from the Middle East, we should have no further concerns about terrorists attacking us because we'll have extracted their motivation for attacking us. What, we're, what he's saying is, and I believe and I agree with this, uh -huh. is we should not be involved, it's, it's taking the advice of the founders. We should not be involved in foreign entanglements mm -hmm. that uh, when we do, we're going to get ourselves in trouble. And not only that, we're just like Rome. We've spread our empire way too thin. Mm -hmm. We have over 900 bases in 150 countries. Mm -hmm. We're all over the world and we're broke. So what's going to happen? It does happen? sound vaguely like Rome, say, circa two, yeah, 200. Ex exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I mean, I, I think politically, and pol politics is always kind of a momentum thing, I think I have issue with some of Ron Paul's foreign policy. But I do think that the mood of the country is a little bit war-weary. You know, we've done that. We've spilt our blood. We've made our point. They attacked. They attacked us. We responded but enough already, we've got trouble at home, let's bring them home. That seems to be what Ron Paul's saying, and I think that's resonating, and I think that's why it's going up in the but, polls. But he's also saying uh, the way you cement a relationship with a foreign country isn't through your troops, it's right. through trade. So yeah. that being, he's not saying be an isolationist. He's uh -huh. not saying don't trade with Iraq or Iran or right. any other country. He's saying let's bring our troops home. Uh -huh. And if you think from a common sense point of view, what's going to happen? Because Iraq is the one pushing to get our troops out of there right now. Yeah. <clears throat> what's going to happen? Our troops are going to come home. They are going to be in bed with Iran and other countries. Yeah. And it's going to happen. Those are the countries that are going to have to figure out how they are going to work together. Yeah. And, how, and their biggest issues are all economics. I'll tell Their you. <laughs> issues are feeding themselves. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and we want to get back to Ron Paul, but <laughs> the Middle East is ne is never-ending fascination. Here's the best case scenario. We establish a democracy in Iraq. The rest of the Middle Eastern countries see, oh, what a wonderful democracy. These guys get to vote. They get to dip their finger in the ink. And that's where you get this, you know, uh, Arab Spring and all these other people throwing off all these dictators. They're going to set up wonderful democracies, and it's going to be a one wonderful thing. That's the best case scenario. Worst case scenario is they're throwing off these, you know, terrible dictators, but all of a sudden, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood and even a more heinous group is coming in. You see the... the um, uh, uh, the persecution of the Christians in right. Egypt right now, that's and right. that's terrible. So it's it's the law of in unintended Iraq. consequences. And I mean, ah, you know, the Middle East is absolutely, you know, uh, very frustrating. You don't know which way to well, turn. Look at Ronald Reagan. He, he pulled out all the our troops, right? Well, they right. killed how many Marines? And he yeah. said, it, uh, Middle Eastern politics is totally mind-boggling. We're yeah. out of there. Yeah, he did. And he, he had the uh, battleship New Jersey, and they were firing shells in there. Mm -hmm. But Look, I think he's got the right message at this time where people are like, enough with this. And you you know, know, we've sent our sons and daughters over there. They've come back wounded and, and killed. And, and what do we have to, right. to see? All right. We can talk about this forever, but we want to talk about, you know, local pol or uh, um, national politics, too. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it extends beyond the Middle East. I mean, we have troops still in South Korea and Japan for, you know, over 50 years. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, part of the problem is th those are wealthy nations. I mean, why are we subsidizing their defense? I think at this point Japan can take care of its own defense. Same with Europe. I mean, you know, not only do we have troops stationed in Germany, 
but you know, NATO has shown itself incapable of doing anything without the United States. So, the, so we're subsidizing their socialism that's bankrupting them, mm -hmm. and we're sending ourselves into bankruptcy, not only with our own socialism, but also with our own militarism and being the world's de facto cop. Which brings us to cutting the military budget. The numbers I heard, we talked about this beforehand, was $500 billion. He would, he would cut that from the Department of Defense in a blink of an eye. And he points out, and I had these at the top of my head, he points out that even with a $500 billion cut in the Department of Defense budget, we would st we still spend five times as much as the, either the rest of the world combined or the next you know, leading you know, every country, military. I think twice as much as every country on the face of the earth. So we're, we're fine. But yeah, do you understand why that makes people nervous when they're talking about Ron Paul? What, what are your thoughts? No, um, oh, I understand why it makes people nervous, but I think they have to sit back and say, well, you bring all these troops back home. Mm -hmm. One of the things he said, we'd be better off putting our troops on our borders than having them all over the world mm -hmm. to defend our borders, which we haven't defended. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ron Paul is not for, Ron Paul's not going to get in there and start cutting every, cutting people, as an example. Uh -huh. He has a plan that says, by attrition, you know, he's going to whittle government down to its right size. Mm -hmm. And he is for defense. He's for continuing to build defense, mm -hmm. bu the defense budget. But just by bringing everyone home, you save all that money. Yeah. And once you, and once again, I get back to that 44 cents on the dollar that we're paying for just the debt. Right. Once you can solve that, think of every bridge in the United States being able to be built using the money that we've saved from all these uh, government. And people talk about, oh, this is going to decimate our economy. It's not. It might hurt the economy of Egypt or the economy of, uh, yeah. of Iraq, but it's not going to hurt our economy. So bringing our troops home is step one, foreign policy. But step two, and more importantly, Ron Paul is going to help our economy because he's going to reduce the debt. Mm -hmm. Everyone, listen, if we only uh, convince you to do one thing, every time you hear a candidate, ask what programs they're going to reduce. Not just how much they're going to reduce, but what programs. We love to talk about dollars. Yeah. You know, how many billion we're going to save. Well, what programs are you reducing? Yeah. How are you going to save those dollars? Rand Department Paul. of Education <laughs> right, at the federal on. level, out of there. Go on, Department man. of Defense, closing foreign bases, bringing our troops home. Huge savings. Absolutely. Where are the other two chunks of savings he's talking about? Well, I think housing, the, um, housing, Department of Housing. Department, Department of, of Housing and Urban Development. And Transportation. Like and Department of Transportation. I just want to mention one thing, too, which is, goes counterintuitive. Ron Paul is the only um, candidate that served in the military. He's the only veteran running. Uh -huh. And um, he gets more double the donations from the troops than all the other candidates combined. All right. I want to uh, plug this one more time. We do have a minute or two. And then I want you to queue up the, okay. the last video we're going to go out at. The event, if you're anywhere near the town of Ridgefield, and by the way, if you don't live in Ridgefield, it's unfortunate. You should live in Ridgefield. But come on out on, uh, on Thursday evening, November 3rd at 7 p.m. Uh, at Ridgefield Town Hall, it's right on Main Street, and they're gonna, it's going to be a discussion, an open question and answer time uh, with Ron Paul. And if you get that turned around and get it queued up, ready to go. And also, Marty, if you support another candidate, we will have time for you to get up and say why you're supporting that candidate. Right. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much uh, for coming in. Um, we're going we're gonna to end this segment with one more of these uh, highly slick uh, Ron Paul. Okay. And, I, and I really appreciate it very much. And I think that for the, for the rest of the conservative Republican Party, I think we have so much in common. Mm -hmm. and, and the energy that, and the perspective that you guys bring is just fantastic. Yeah. So Thank you, Marty. I appreciate it. And Thank I you. hope you, you can come back in. What's oh. the other guy's name you're talking about? 
Richard Land. Richard Land. Richard Land. Yeah. We'd like to have that young guy right. come in here too. So okay, here we go. We're gonna go with we're gonna go with this uh, and close it out. Veteran with a plan to keep America secure, protect America by securing our borders and rebuilding our defenses, not by acting as the world's policemen, spending trillions nation building overseas. The Paul Plan for Security: Start protecting America's borders. Stop wasting American money. Ron Paul, restore America now. I'm Ron Paul, and I approve this message. Hi, welcome to Community Access Channel 23. Let's go on inside and see what's going on. Dream big. Hey, this is Big T here telling you to dream big. Hey, at Channel 23, you can dream big and direct your own show. Dream big. We want you to all dream big. We dream big. Cable access, Channel 23, dream big. Call us today at 203-792-1265 and find out how you can dream big at Channel 23. Did you know that Comcast Cable provides a professional television studio to the public? Along with the equipment and training necessary to produce your very own TV show. And best of all, it's free. So what is public access? Public access is people sharing ideas. People sharing information. Sharing the environment. Sharing music. Sharing dreams. Public access is people sharing education. Art. Politics. Resources. People sharing civic pride. Public access is people sharing fun. Public access, it's people, just like you and me. For more information, contact your public access studio. See you on TV. Their numbers are growing more and more, more than a year ago, more than a decade ago. More people now living in this state than nearly any state in the union. One out of every eight people in America one out of every 10 families in America, one out of every six children in America, 33 million Americans struggling just to remain standing, 33 million Americans teetering on the brink of hunger, sickness, hardship, uncertainty, 33 million Americans in these United States descending into poverty. And as their futures fall, so does our nations. On the football field, you've got to stay focused and not get distracted. The same is true on the road. So before your wireless phone becomes a distraction, take a time out for safety. In bad weather or traffic, call later, dial sensibly, and use a hands-free device. You know, your wireless phone can be your best safety tool. To call for help, stop a crime, however you use it, remember, with wireless, safety is your call. Global warming. Some say irreversible consequences are 30 years away. 30 years? That won't affect me. would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Here we go! Okay, that's good. Oh, okay. Ow! Oh, oh. Maybe there's another way. People! The flood is imminent! Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? 
Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Um, how do I speed up a passport application? For a trip I'm taking. Don't bring your government questions to just anyone. Go to the official source, riskgov.gov, from local weather to student loans. You can really use some people's skills. Hey, how do I get in on a government auction? You know, like for a car? Go to firstgov.gov, from changing your address to government auctions to renewing your driver's license. And don't everybody chime in at once. What's early retirement going to do to my Social Security? Hello? Briskgov.gov. From Social Security to Medicare, it's a monumental source of information about federal, state, and local government. You did work for the government, right? Welcome back to the Marty Heiser Show. Uh, that little preview of that uh, Noah's Ark movie is very funny with the guy from The Office. You should see it. We're joined now by Jan Rifkinson. Thank you so much for coming in. My pleasure, Marty. Now, for those of you that live in Ridgefield, you might, might have seen his lawn signs, which we would show you, but apparently it's breaking a rule. So picture this handsome uh, face right here along with his man's best friend, and we'll get a picture of the dog later. Those are the signs you'll see all over Ridgefield, and, and it's reflecting your run for the Board of Selectmen. Yes, sir. What in the world possessed you? You're an incredibly successful television producer. You produced uh, Sesame Street. You founded Good Morning America. You had a hand in starting CNBC, which for those of us that aren't uh, of that ilk, we'll, we'll look over. Mm -hmm. But you've had an incredibly successful career. You're enjoying your life. What possessed you to run for office? Well, I decided that I could either be uh, part of the problem or part of the solution. Okay. And uh, Carol and I moved to Richfield about 13 years ago, and after a while, I sort of became interested in some of the issues in town. Right. So, uh, since I like going to original sources, uh, instead of listening to hearsay and stuff, I decided to go to all the meetings. Yes. And so I'd go to all the meetings, and when I got to the meetings, I realized I didn't understand a lot of stuff, so I started asking a lot of questions. And it became a joke, because I always asked a question, like, what is that, or where is that, or what does it mean, or, you know, that sort of thing. And, um, and then after I started to learn about stuff and do some, my own research, I started to write articles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'd write articles on issues for the, at the press. And, uh, and then uh, after that, uh, I said to myself, well, the next step is to get involved. So I thought about it for a couple of years, to be honest, because uh, it, it's a big job. Um, you know, it, it's a big job running, or should you be elected? No, should uh, you be elected, okay, it's a big okay. job. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, it's a big job, it's a big responsibility. Uh, you're one of five people who are trying to measure different things for the entire community. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> and then there's the other half of me, which doesn't like politics. Yeah. So I said, well, now how do I, how do, I do these two things together? Uh, and in my entire career, I never belonged to a political party because when you worked in news particularly, yeah. Uh, at that time, in those years. You have anyway. to feign objectivity, especially if you're part of the liberal press. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I, I had to take my shot. That's go okay. Ahead, That's all right. <laughs> um, and so I never belonged to a political party, so I said, okay, well, if I'm going to run, I'm going to do it without, running for, without joining a political party. Yeah. That's the only way I can be comfortable. Well, I'll tell so you, I did that. Uh, being an observer of your campaign, and for some of you that haven't noticed, and by the way, we're going to cut to your, is it fair to say your running mate? Um, yes. Well, what, what is the running mate's uh, name, by the way? Her name is Stella Bella. Stella Bella. If we can get a shot of Stella Bella, that's your running mate. Now, there's Stella on, you know, very well behaved. Uh, <laughs> there's Stella. And then for, for some of you that, again, have seen the lawn signs, you can see a portrait. It's a fusion candidacy, a Jan <laughs> and Stella. Um, what would the division, division of responsibility be between you and the dog should you be elected? Well, let's see. Uh, I, I would do the talking. Okay, that's good. That's good. Yeah, and, and she would do the entertainment portion. Okay. And, but, and if I ever got into trouble, you know, she, she would be the uh, foil. 
Okay. okay. Keep me keep me honest. All yeah. right. Well, it's a, it's a great dog. And actually, I was I was reading up about you. I mean, the internet's a wonderful thing. Mm. But you really have a heart for um, uh, dogs, rescuing dogs. Yeah, and I do. Part of that. You uh, Bouvier Rescue. Bouvier. Uh, yeah, Bouvier. Bouvier. Bouvier Rescue. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, the Bouvier uh, was a breed that I came in contact with in 1968 in, in, in Holland when I was in Amsterdam. Is that this dog? Is no, oh, no, no, no. Okay, this, sorry, go ahead. This was 1968, Marty. Okay, okay, Even I'm sorry. you were on the board of finance, you should be able to add and subtract. I know, I know. I'm just saying, no, not <laughs> this dog, but is that dog yes. that make? Yes, it's yes. Not that, that particular that dog. That breed, but, yep. So that dog is a? Bouvier de Flandre. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, anyway, uh, I first came in contact with that dog there. And when I got, I, it was an animal I had never seen before. And if we have time, I'll tell you the story how I ran into the first one. But anyway, when I got back to the States, I said, I want one of those. Okay. And I looked around, and at the time, I got my first Bouvier, which was in 1972. There were only about 500 of them registered in the country. Okay. And so as I started to get involved with them and do research and find out about the breed and that kind of stuff, uh, I discovered that most of them were, uh, had been killed off during World War II by the Nazis. Is that right? Yep, they hated them because they used to pull a small cannon, they used to pull uh, oh. people on, you know, wounded on stretchers. Okay. They were uh, farm dogs, they were messenger dogs. Huh. They were very hard working and very loyal and stuff, so the Nazis would sort of shoot them on sight. And some of the farmers who had them hid them in the country, uh -huh. uh, which is what saved the breed, and then a few of them came to this country. Wow. And, um, and so, um, as a breed, the breed never got popular, thank, thankfully. Yeah. And when I started to find that there were people who would get them because they think they were cute, right. and then all of a sudden they'd be living with a 110-pound dog, she's not one of them, right. uh, who was very assertive, and uh -huh. they'd say, oh, I can't deal with this, huh. and they'd get rid of them. They'd put them in rescue or leave them on a doorstep somewhere. So this particular breed of involved. dog has mm -hmm. been a passion of yours for years. 40 and, and some odd years. Wow, that's yep. great. Yep. Okay, let's talk uh, local politics. Sure. Because that's, and, and, and uh, you know, full disclosure, I'm a member of the Board of Finance, and I have always appreciated your both attendance at the meeting and input. And it, on more than one occasion, I've asked you on particular issues, mm -hmm. where do you stand on this and why? Mm -hmm. and, and you've been an incredible resource because yep. you, you give a lot of thought to this. Thank you. But, uh, but, um, oh, one other thing as far as your kind of non-political, political campaign, for our viewing audience, where is your campaign headquarters? My campaign headquarters is under two pine trees in the median, in a parking lot, uh, at uh, the marketplace at Copps Hill in front of uh, Ross's uh, Breads and Cheese 109. And the reason it's there is because I promised to run an open campaign. Well, you talk about open, you talk about transparency, you are, you are out in the middle of a uh, median. It's actually a, a nice spot, yeah, but certainly accessible to the to Yeah, the I put my little sign up. I got permission from the man who owns the property. I put my little sign up, and I sit and I have coffee. People come and talk and pick up stuff and leave. And I go to other places, too. Yeah. But there are only certain days that I'm there okay. with my office hours. Well, I was reading in the, uh, in the Ridgefield Press. Uh -huh. I don't know. Have you seen the press this week? It's I hot, did. It's hot off the press. I did. And uh, you were involved in, uh, in the debate. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times you were taking a different opinion, but let me let's go through sure. local issues. The Schlumberger property, and for those of you that aren't in Ridgefield, there was a big corporation that had I think 45 acres right in town, and there's talk <coughs> that the town should buy the property to control our development. What do you say? Uh, the question is, uh, people use the, the phrase "controlling our destiny," mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, and I will take a slight, and some people say, if you buy, you must buy it to prevent a certain kind of housing, uh, high density housing coming to Ridgefield in the middle of town. Uh, my answer to this point is I think we should control the property, but I'm not sure that buying it up front is the only solution. There may be other solutions right. to look at. Mm -hmm. And to that end, I started to look. Uh, zoning was one of them, which doesn't seem to be a practical uh, thing. Um, and there is also the possibility, which may not be practical, of doing nothing mm -hmm. uh, and letting matters take their own course and 10 years from now um, trying to take the land by eminent domain or whatever. My problem is that we have not gotten a lot of information on this. Mm -hmm. What we've gotten is a lot of opinion. Buy it or you'll get this kind of housing. And my thing is that I want information. So for example, Marty, uh -huh. Uh, if 
we want to build a, um, uh, if we want to buy the land mm -hmm. and sell off some of it and um, uh, use part of it for a municipal campus, right. which might be a fine idea, then I think that it's the first selectman's duty to say to the electorate who have to vote for this purchase, right. one of the reasons we're going to do this is because we want to put an administrative campus on this property. And that administrative campus could cost us 20 to $30 million. And by that you're saying combine the firehouse, the police, police station, maybe and, town hall. And town hall. Pull it out of downtown exactly. and, and put it there. Yeah, huh? and that will cost us X number of dollars to right. do. However, the flip side of that is we will sell town hall, we will sell the Venus building, we will sell the uh, fire station, right. uh, and we may have, we, we could turn, possibly turn a town hall into a boutique hotel, uh, we could turn the uh, firehouse into a restaurant, uh -huh. uh, Venus building we don't need at all, that right away, I, I, I got all the property uh, listings that we own right. uh, from, uh, from uh, the insurance company who, who insures us has estimated the value of that as $19 million. Well, if you put all that together, uh -huh. so, you know, you got 19 here and two, two and a half for town hall and another million for something else, you've already got $23 million. Is there any so part when, well, of this that makes you nervous? Well, let me, let me just finish my, okay. let me just finish my thing. I, I apologize for taking so long. No. But if you add those numbers together and say that's the kind of money we're going to use to build the, the administrative campus, mm -hmm. then somebody, when they're thinking about the whole issue, mm -hmm. can say, now I understand why you're buying it, how much it's going to cost, and how you're going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. That's what we don't have. What we have is buy it, or you're going to be flooded with high-density uh, housing. Right. And that's the only choice we have so far. We have not even seen the purchase agreement. We have not seen a any document involved in this whatsoever. Yeah. So do I think it's a good idea? I think it's a good idea to, 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 to control it. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to explore all the options and get all the information about all the options so people can make an honest, educated decision at voting time on December 6th. The most, the most recent uh, manifestation is there apparently is uh, some citizens that are, would like to buy the campus and put a, a art gallery there uh -huh. and house some of that. that. That seems very attractive uh, to me. Uh, absolutely. You know, I think that would, be, that would be an ideal setting for something like absolutely. that. Absolutely, but when I asked the first selectman who said there was some interest in the um, in in the Johnson Building, yeah, which, the, is, which is a glass building yeah. and has architectural significance. Uh, huh? well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> one it's, man's it's one, architecturally <laughs> significant building is another man's. It, well, no, uh, no, no. I I like Philip Johnson stuff, but this particular building happens to be one of his lesser works. Yeah. But, when but I thought when, when I saw Glass House, I was envisioning a, a concrete, concrete, and you could see through it. Mm -hmm. I think they have one of those in New Canaan. In New Canaan, or something glass like that. House. That's what I was envisioning. That's where you look. When I go over there, it's kind of a bit. It's glass. So right. It's a little chunky. But right. anyways. But uh, when I asked the first selectman, I said, "Gee, that's a wonderful thing." Uh -huh. uh, who who is interested? I mean, what what's the story? Can't talk about it. It's a big secret. Yeah. The next day, I read in the newspaper. Well, there's a person who has a, a an art uh, collection that yeah. they want to use it for display. Yeah. No, you got to tell people that. Well, I mean, it, it is makes, on the front page of the paper this week. But it wasn't that. It, it couldn't divulge yeah. this at a town meeting. Now, someone's considering voting for you. Yes, sir. Are you a like there, there seems to be a tagline uh, from uh, a certain political party that says "invest in Ridgefield, invest in Ridgefield." Some people think that that's kind of code for, "Hey, we're not afraid of spending money, and if it means raising taxes, so be it." But mm -hmm. we gotta, we gotta do this. So that's kind of the the attitude. Mm -hmm. um, are you a invest in Ridgefield? Don't worry about spending money if it raises taxes. We want the best we can do. Or are you more a fiscally conservative, we really need to keep an eye on, on taxes and keep Ridgefield affordable for young families with children as well as some of our senior citizens. Where would you fall on that spectrum uh, and why? Closer to the latter, to the second. Um, if somebody is going to spend money, if we're going to spend money in Ridgefield, mm -hmm. I need to see the direct uh, benefit it will make to the, for the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. If there's no direct benefit, practical benefit, right. then I'm not sure it should be spent. On the flip side of that, uh, it seems to me that we 
we, I, I don't want to be the kind of person that says you never spend money because there are certain things you do need to spend money on right. in order to maintain stuff or, or, or even improve things. Uh -huh. But the fact remains that Richfield is attractive to young families, as you put it, and mm -hmm. to others, uh, not simply because of our good schools, but because in, our, in, the, in the cities, the towns, in our area, in our DRG, as people like to mm -hmm. call them, we are the cheapest. Mm -hmm. We have the lowest housing costs, mm -hmm. and we have the lowest taxes. Mm -hmm. okay? That also is what makes Richfield attractive and livable. And if you change that formula and you start to make it so expensive, you're going to change the tapestry of Richfield. You're going to change the personality of Richfield. And I personally would not like to see that done because Richfield is a beautiful community, uh, mixed people. You have blue-collar people. You have uh, white-collar people. You have retired people. Uh, you know, you've, you've got artists who live there. This is a, what makes it a wonderful community, and you get to keep it affordable. you have seniors. Yep. Absolutely. You have uh, young families with children. Exactly. You, yeah. Yeah, no, and I, I am scared to death, frankly, that if you keep, we keep going this way without any, I don't know, <laughs> without any mm, sense to it, uh, or not much sense to it, we're going to price ourselves out of that market, and we're going to be something else. All right. Well, let me put it to you. There. Let me so. just give it to you, give it to you raw. Go if ahead. you take this stance, and yeah. then uh, the board of ed budget comes up, and you say, you know what? In this economy, and the way things are, uh, we don't think you need a 2.9 percent increase. We think you need a 1.8 percent increase. Then you are labeled. Well, obviously, this guy doesn't like children. <laughs> Does he have kids in the school system? No. no. Aha! See, he's a dirty, rotten scoundrel. Mm -hmm. What's your response to that? Well, my response to that is I'm not sure that I would look at a 2.9% budget and say it should be 1.8. I would have to know why it's 2.9, mm -hmm. what's in it, and make some kind of a reasoned judgment as to whether we really need it. Mm -hmm. What I did discover last year uh, was when the Board of Finance uh, cut $850,000 from the school budget, mm -hmm. Not from the school budget, I take that back, from the raise, the increase in the school budget. Uh, everybody screamed that the sky was going to fall and the education was going to fail and, and our real estate values were going to go down further than they have already right. uh, due to the economy. And, uh, and none of that really happened. What did happen was, in my opinion, was that the administration or whomever uh, made some decisions to cut... Uh, uh, academic courses like German and art and things like that, which they really didn't have to. Mm -hmm. And if you then say to me, we'll prove that, well, the proof of that is because when you had, when we had a virus in the system, uh, they found $125,000 to take care of that mm -hmm. in that same slash budget, and they returned $150,000 to the town. Well, you add those two things up, you've already got about $225,000 or $275,000. Mm -hmm. German only cost $60,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So they already had the money, even with this cut. So what does that say to me? That says to me that we're, maybe we're not budgeting efficiently. Mm -hmm. And maybe the money that we're spending, this huge amount of money that we're spending, isn't really going where it should go, which is into the classroom to education. And that's the only part that concerns me. You make incredibly reasonable sense on this, but I'm just telling you the politics is, of it is, I mean, we had members of the Board of Finance that had businesses in towns, and there was an organized mm -hmm. boycott of their business yes, I know. because of that. I we had other that. guys who were on the Board of Finance whose children literally had issues at school. That, that family's moving out of well, town. Let me, let me, let so me. I'm just telling you, uh, be forewarned. I, I because, like, I mean, you're, you're making a lot of sense, and I think you're speaking for a lot of people, but uh, it well, can let be me, Let me tough. respond to this intimidation kind of thing. Yes. You don't seem to be like a man that's easily intimidated. No. I, what is somebody going to do? Throw a dead raccoon over my fence or something? I mean, yeah. you know, I, the point is I don't have a kid in school. Uh -huh. And the point is I don't have a business. So, and I am not affiliated with a political party. Uh -huh. So I should be able to speak logically and calmly and rationally about an issue, which is what I intend to do. Uh -huh. Now, if people want to call me names for that, so be it. I'm only going to serve for four years, Marty. Uh -huh. I am never going to run again. I'm not seeking higher office. And the reason for that is because I think these boards need new blood. And I hope with my, with my running as an unaffiliated, yeah. I will prove a point, if I'm elected, that other people can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you that, so. just on a human level. Are you sure. enjoying the process? 
I am loving the process. Really? Absolutely. Oh. I, I'm meeting some fascinating people. I'm having some great conversations, people I never would have met otherwise. Oh. Uh, I, I've, had, uh, I've had some funny experiences. Give me one. Oh, well, I had a lady. I, I, normally, I don't like intruding on people's lives, you know, because they're, they're busy going off and doing stuff. And, oh. and so I, I, one lady said to me, I, I said, excuse me, can I have two seconds of your time? I just want to give you my little palm card and tell you that my name is Jan Rifkinson and I'm an unaffiliated candidate running for Board of Selectmen and, and I hope you'll consider my candidacy. And she said, I, I don't want I, I don't want, I don't, I don't have time, I'm too busy, I, I'm, whatever. And Marty, it took her 45 seconds to tell me that she was busy <laughs> when only I wanted was two seconds just to give her the card. Right, right? Right. But she had to stop, turn around, explain to me that she was very busy. It took her 45 seconds to do it. Uh, you know. no. no, you get that. Now, uh, what, uh, besides, besides the debate, Besides yeah. appearing on this incredible television show, uh -huh. um, uh, what are some of the other things? Have you been knocking on doors? Have you been going to events that you might not otherwise go to, but you're making yourself visible? Well, I'm trying. You know, I, 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 I fight two, 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 two things. One is I'm basically a shy person. Really? Yeah. Right. And, and uh, I've, I've always been behind the camera, never in front of the camera. Yeah. And I don't like interrupting people's uh, business. I understand. Uh, you know, getting in their face all the time. So, yes, I, I have gone to Stop and Shop. I've gone down to the, to the um, Recycle Center and, you know, all those things that I will continue to do it from now until uh, the election. And uh, I even have two magnetic signs of me and the dog that I have for my car. Uh -huh. So sooner or later, I'll drive around with those too. It's just it's just a fun thing, you know. And it's and it's what I love really love about it is it's grassroots democracy. Uh -huh. It's grassroots democracy. I mean, well, fabulous. I want to tell you, you know, you talk about grassroots democracy, but uh, the fact that uh, um, someone of your talent, uh, you know, the, I, I won't overstate it, yeah, but involved don't. involved in the beginning of uh, such television programs as Sesame Street. Good Morning America, CNBC, uh, producer of 2020. I want to ask you about John Stossel. What's he like in person? Skinny. Skinny. There you have it. You heard it here first. <laughs> uh, John Stossel is skinny. Uh, but uh, over 4,000 hours of network television that you had a hand in directing and producing. And, uh, and, and I've enjoyed getting to know you over the years just with your involvement. Likewise. likewise. But likewise. It, it, it's people like this that are volunteering their time to, to bring their – life's experience and their rationality and their thinking to bear on issues in a very difficult, I mean, this isn't happy-go-lucky, everything's roses, uh, you know, leave it to beaver suburbs. These are some tough, tough economic times that we're going through. And the fact that you and others like you are willing to step up is, is, is commendable. Okay. On that note, I just want to say we have a next week, November 3rd, on this show, all five candidates for the Board of Finance will be appearing on this show okay. for a live debate. That means you can call in and you can ask the candidates questions live on television. 438-2003 will have the number up. Anyone can call in. That's going to be next Thursday night. So go to the Ron Paul thing first, 7 o'clock, get a cup of coffee, get home, turn on the TV, 9 to 10, we're going to have that. Um, the following week uh, um, after that, we're going to, we're going to have a, a group called Rachel's Home. Uh, it has to do with uh, young ladies and women that are recovering from abortions. The following Thursday is uh, uh, Thanksgiving. You should go home. And then Nina Majerus, many of you know her from Ridgefield. She has a book out, and we're going to be talking about her very entertaining book. But I want to thank you so much for coming in. My, my pleasure. Really, my and I want to thank your dog. If you could just share with the dog that what a thrill it was to have them in. This is a first, <laughs> um, and it was interesting to hear about that, too. And uh, thank you for joining us for another uh, shot at the Marty Heiser Show. And we're going to be on next week, same time, 9 to 10. It's going to be live because it's going to be that debate. So set your TiVo, set your clock, and, and call in and, and give it to these candidates because they're going to have to answer live. Thanks for joining us. The Marty Heiser Show, where? You always get the truth, or at least what my warped mind thinks of is the truth. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week.